So welcome everyone um, to this uh, international discussion on the implications of COVID-19 for climate change. Uh, this discussion is being jointly organized by the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, IWPR in Central Asia, and the OSC Academy in Bishkek. Um, my name is Mirza Sadakar Huda. I will be the moderator of this discussion today. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the OSC Academy in Bishkek. I work on energy and environmental governance, and I also do some work on the Belt and Road Initiative. So before I introduce the topic of today's discussion and also our esteemed uh, presenters, I would just like to share with you the agenda and some of the instructions um, that have been passed down onto me to share with um, all the, the presenters and participants today. So firstly, we've, we've chosen this particular format of um, discussion to replicate face-to-face -face interactions as much as technology permits. So if it is possible for you, please do turn on your webcam um, just so that we have that uh, you know, visual uh, element in our interactions. Um, all the guests will be muted for the duration of the speaker's presentations to ensure that there are no interruptions when our speakers are, are presenting their papers. If you do have any questions, please, please do type it in the chat room. And if you face any technical difficulties, please reach out to IWPR Central Asia or Jamilia Aita Kunopa via direct message. Um, and lastly, I'd like to let you know that the meeting is being recorded. Um, and so we will be sharing some of the images or some of the discussions through social media. Um, so we have four very accomplished speakers today discussing a very important topic. And the speakers are from Central Asia, UAE, as well as the United Kingdom. And each speaker will present for up to 10 minutes, seven to 10 minutes, after which we will proceed to the question and answer session. And uh, before I introduce each of the speakers, I would just like to speak very briefly about the topic of our discussion today. So the global COVID-19 crisis has led to an increasing debate on the impact of human actions on the environment. And I see this debate um, developing along two strands. So uh, firstly, there has been a lot of uh, debate as to whether human-induced climate change has played a role in the creation of this global crisis. And if so, should we now be preparing for many more future health crises uh, due to the continuation of um, you know, the degradation of the global environment. And secondly, um, there has been debate on whether the COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, has, given, um, has given emphasis to uh, sustainable development and the green economy. So um, a lot of uh, policymakers and academics have stressed that the post-COVID-19 economy would be a different economy uh, which will be uh, determined by issues such as renewable energy and sustainable infrastructure. And um, it is wonderful to see that the four, four papers being presented today touch on many of these issues, um, as well as um, you know, the broader uh, global problem of climate change and how it impacts um, you know, uh, human development, human economy. Um, so um, without further ado, I would just like to introduce our first speaker, which would be Dr. Rahat Sabirekov. Um, his paper is titled COVID-19 and Green Recovery. So Dr. Rahat is a postdoctoral fellow at the OSC Academy in Bishkek. He received his PhD from the School of Economics and Business at Norwegian University of Life Sciences and his master's degree from the University of Birmingham. He serves an, as an author for Intergovernmental Platform for Ecosystem Services and Biodiversity Assessment Report. And his research interests include environmental economics, ecosystem services, natural capital, and natural resource management. So over to you, Rahat. I'm, I'm going to share my screen and uh, I have a little presentation to present in 15 minutes. Uh, can you see all the, my screen in the, uh, yeah, I guess? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Um, so, as uh, Mirza uh, actually said, that the presentation is, uh, and, and as you have seen from the agenda, it's about the COVID and green recovery. So, 
as we all see that there is a debate going on how we will recover from the COVID-19 impacts and if there are any changes to our will be there any changes to our current economic policy what does it mean to climate change and these are a very uh, urgent at the same time very old questions uh, at least in the, uh, this question has been discussed for the last uh, 50 40 years let's say so in these 15 minutes i would like to talk about primarily three things first uh, what was the impact uh, of the covid 19 on global emissions uh, whether it's short run is it will it have uh, any long run implications and the second point is about economic policies and climate change in pandemic era so what are the uh, let's say policy avenues and responses from different governments to the uh, post-pandemic era, let's say, what are the plans uh, that are being discussed? And then concluding remark is, uh, is, green eco uh, is green recovery actually is likely to happen or not? So uh, what we have seen that the, uh, the, uh, the immediate impact of the COVID-19 across the global economies have been, uh, it's basically lockdowns, shutdowns of many industries, which resulted in an unprecedented fall in uh, CO2 emissions globally. And it's uh, according to different estimates, and there is a consensus that it's the largest uh, fall in CO2 emissions after the Second World War. And uh, so what we have witnessed that uh, if you look at the graph, for instance, uh, what we've seen that in the starting from the beginning of this year, there has been a sharp decline about 8% in the first months of the year. And uh, uh, it has been, and now the interesting thing that it started in China, uh, and then now it's traveling, this lockdown or drop in emissions is, uh, has started slowly kind of shifting from one country to another. But globally, it has generated unprecedented fall. Uh, and there are some optimistic voices. So look, we have, uh, decrease the CO2 emissions, but uh, clearly uh, it's not enough. If you look at the trend by different projections, so we have an 8% fall, but then uh, there are different estimates, but what we see that it's definitely CO2 emissions uh, globally are going to pick up again. The question is how fast uh, should we uh, anticipate what will be the result of the uh, COVID-19 on the uh, economic recovery? And if we look at the different countries, uh, paper by Louis Jean et al. Uh, in 2020, we see that uh, uh, comparatively uh, in uh, many countries, we see that the uh, emission reductions, but, uh, but different countries are obviously, this is uh, be beginning of uh, 20, uh, 2020, so the, the data a little bit updated, but what we see that the emissions are falling, uh, largest uh, uh, drop is in two sectors related to transport and travel, it's basically the aviation and ground transport. And at the same time, we see that uh, the demand for, uh, for energy from the uh, trade and industry has sharply uh, declined. And uh, global energy demand is estimated to fall by around 6%. Uh, and different policies now are being discussed how to reopen economies. What we see today is uh, many countries in Europe um, are starting to reopen again. Uh, many states in the United States are discussing. Uh, China has reopened and then in Beijing last days, last weeks, actually, they're again uh, going to, to the locked lockdown. So what, uh, so how we should be reopen our economies? Uh, so this can we uh, uh, remain and <clears throat> remain on low carbon uh, on low carbon emission levels. Uh, so these are the questions which are being discussed, and uh, many scholars actually have seen and uh, have seen this drop, and they say, okay, this is a, a golden opportunity uh, to combat the climate change. So we have seen uh, uh, that there is evidence that the uh, current trajectory of global economic development. Uh, will increase uh, uh, risks of uh, such zo zo uh, zoonotic diseases, diseases which are, uh, can travel, uh, can be transferred from animals to humans. And this is a direct result of the climate change, they argue, destruction of biodiversity, ecosystem services, and such events as land, deg land degradation and deforestation. And they argue that this is uh, COVID-19 and other 
uh, diseases is actually the result of the climate change. At the same time, uh, many countries around the world, they see that this is as an opportunity to seize the moment um, and uh, to implement so-called green recovery plans, which basically lay foundation for reopening economy. So now we have lower emissions, let's keep the momentum and uh, let's, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, reduce our global uh, CO2 footprint. So, uh, and uh, we have a report, a recent report by International Energy Agency, I guess you, many of you have already seen and there are uh, basically two scenarios of further uh, plans of how the world will develop. So, uh, if you look at the graph, so we have seen, we've seen that in the beginning it has been falling and then without sustainable recovery. So, sustainable recovery is basically a term which is, uh, I would say, uh, equivalent to green recovery, recovery plans uh, and same time with sustainable recovery. So we see that variation is uh, quite large, but the trajectories are very different. Uh, so uh, if we are to recover sustainably or in a green way, so there is a large decrease in uh, CO2 emissions and hence the, our impact on the uh, global climate will be decreased. At the same time, if we uh, continue business as usual, we, we will um, witness another trend which has been going for the last uh, uh, 70 years, uh, 80 years, uh, that uh, the carbon emissions have been increasing and then uh, the climate change will, uh, will intensify as well. Uh, and then, uh, so these are the options and let's look what are the, uh, the governments are doing actually. Uh, what, uh, what is the main, let's say, international uh, organizations such as International Monetary Fund are discussing. So on your screens, you see the quote from uh, IMF director, Kristalina Georgieva, which uh, she says that if recovery to be sustainable, if our world is to become more resilient, we must do everything in our po power to promote a green recovery. So uh, I guess it's, uh, at least to my knowledge, it's uh, uh, very rare when the director of IMF directly, uh, I mean, the, the body was in charge for financial st st uh, stability, uh, financial system in the world. Sorry, you, have, you have two more minutes left. Um, two more minutes. Okay, great. So, uh, and she's, uh, she's calling for the uh, green recovery. And there, are, um, and there are two opposing ways. So first uh, uh, way is let's do it in a green way, such as EU green recovery package calls it. Uh, on the other hand, there are governments which say that, okay, this uh, COVID-19 hit our economies very hard. So we must recover economically very fast and uh, disregard the environmental regulations. And this is the case, for example, in the United States, South Africa, and Mexico. And they have relaxed the environmental regulations. So these uh, are very, two very uh, opposing ways how to deal with the recovery. Uh, so can recovery policies in post COVID-19 period uh, stop climate change? Uh, maybe possibly uh, it can slow down if right policies and uh, implemented at least by the authors Hepburn et al. They say that uh, there is a infrastructure investment needed, uh, retrofits, investment in education, training, research and development. But there are uh, trade-offs. If in the beginning we discuss the trade-off between lives and the economy, should we lock down the economy or save lives. Now the trade-off is shifting uh, from economy to climate. How to reopen the economy? Should we save the economies or should we uh, save the climate? I will at least, this is a discussion which is happening in- uh, 30 in more seconds, Rahat. Yep, one minute, I'll, I'm almost done. Okay. Uh, okay, the concluding slide is the last one. So uh, COVID-19 has shown that cutting global emissions swiftly is possible. Uh, and most likely the green economy will create more jobs. There is evidence, there is a uh, good uh, papers written on this topic and there is a uh, modeling is done. And the third is the trade-offs between economies, human health and environment are not really real. Obviously, I mean, this is clear for, for us, at least in academia, that there is no trade-off between, at least in the long run, between human health and economies and environment. And the last one is uh, there is a lack of global consensus how the economy should be reopened in post COVID-19 world. And this will have actually a direct impact on the climate change. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Rahat, for the excellent presentation. Um, yes, indeed, you raised some very important points. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the trade-off between the environment and the economy, the Gordian knot that we've all been trying to untie, but um, the, the recession that will follow the COVID-19 is um, obviously going to make this um, challenge even more complex. And um, so we will now move on to our next paper presenter. Um, and I would like to invite Dr. Croy Sternberg to invite his paper on COVID-19, China's new Silk Road and the environment. And uh, Dr. Sternberg is a senior research associate at the University of Oxford, Oxford um, at the School of Geography and Environment. He completed a Doctor of Philosophy on pastoral environments in the Gobi Desert from Oxford in 2009. His research there was focused on extreme climate hazards, environment, and social dynamics. Since 2005, Dr. Kroy has continued his research on Mongolia, but also expanded his research into Northern China and Central Asia. So over to you, Dr. Sternberg. I wanna uh, first thank the organizers and, and say it's great to be able to uh, participate and support uh, writers, journalists, academics, and the, the general citizens of, of Kyrgyzstan. And it's a, it's a great topic to look at COVID and climate and something we should do here at Oxford as well. And briefly, I wanna talk about uh, coronavirus, China's uh, new Silk Road and the environment and then tie it to climate. And really just to look at this from the outside in to Kyrgyzstan uh, on how COVID-19 really disrupts systems and, and uh, our approach to how we conceive of daily life, uh, the role of government, the role of investment, things like that. So, uh, you know, when do we ever have such an event that affects the social, the political, the economic uh, and governmental systems at one time? And very quickly, uh, we take this time, the, the role of government changes to protecting lives, health, it's about survival, uh, food, very, uh, shelter, the very basic uh, elements. So in this, we start to re-examine the social contract and the, the bargains under which we live between uh, a people and a government. And I think that creates an opportunity to re-examine some of the structures we have set up in, in how we work and, and what we expect of each other being the, a government and the, and the people. So with this chance to rethink and reimagine how society works, um, it leads me in, in the Kyrgyz contest to think of, of Chinese investment, uh, other foreign investment like Kumtor as well. But uh, we, we know that uh, this Belt and Road Initiative has a, a, a outsized impact in Kyrgyzstan. There's the Zongda oil refinery, but Kyrgyzstan has no oil. The, the heating, uh, issue for $386 million, uh, many, many mines around the country, Sultan Sari I'll, I'll talk about. But also, so here we have a, a time when Kyrgyzstan, 20% uh, uh, of the economy is, is based on, on Chinese investment. So it's Chinese GD, GDP is fueling the, uh, the economy. There's a $2 billion foreign debt to China. So when COVID comes, I was in, uh, in Bishkek in February, and all of a sudden, no one was going to Chinese stores or Chinese restaurants. So very quickly, the Kyrgyz realized that uh, it's something that's coming from outside the, the country. The borders were closed. And uh, really, I'd say Kyrgyzstan's done quite an effective job. I, I read there's been 40 deaths in, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, but the, here in the UK, we have over 60,000. So the ability of the government and the society to to come together and, and uh, really stop much activity, the lockdown that we're, we're, we're in, uh, not, not working like that. So the interesting thing for me is looking at a place like uh, Sultan Sari, the mine, it's one of our field sites. Uh, last, uh, last August, there was the, uh, the big clash between the community and the mine, and uh, that, that closed the, the, the mine in the area. And at that time, one of the, the main complaints that we always hear in our research is it's about the environment and about the jobs. So as of August 7th, when the mine is closed, the environment is not going to be impacted the same way. So the issues of water, access, quality, amount, diversion, pasture, the degradation, things like that. So many of the environmental factors uh, in that area, at least, 
now are not going to be the same issue as before. Um, that was that was a local struggle, uh, but now coronavirus gives us the the same impact around the country. I know the uh, the Kyrgyz border is closed. What's what's happened in Central Asia, and Mongolia? A lot of the Chinese workers have not come back to the countries because of of the uh, the closed borders. So I really think this is a time in Kyrgyzstan to to step back and see what type of uh, business investment engagement and infrastructure you want. This is a time to uh, let the government know how, how you can protect your environment. Uh, there are many good laws in Kyrgyzstan. One of the issues I, that I, I found is how are they enforced? So here we have a, a, a time when the interaction and, the, and the, the deal between citizens and the government will ha, ha, has, has uh, shifted and been disrupted. So if, if uh, mining, uh, road building, et cetera, uh, changes because of COVID, uh, it can be used as an opportunity to when, when it, it comes back or is restarted in a different form can be uh, more sustainable in a way that suits Kyrgyzstan. Particularly in the countryside, um, the herders have their traditional ways of dealing with climate. Farmers know uh, what crops they plant, when they plant, things like this. So there, there are some customary ways in Kyrgyzstan to actually live sustainably. And maybe the, the foreign investment and foreign direction that's happened so much in Kyrgyzstan uh, can be changed as a result of this uh, COVID era. And with that, with more sustainable use of, of land and environment and water, then when climate impacts Kyrgyzstan, it, it might have less effect on, on uh, human well-being and livelihoods. So I really want to say, can COVID be an opportunity to improve uh, investment and environmental uh, interaction and uh, better prepare Kyrgyzstan for a changing climate in the future? Thank you. I think uh, Mirza has some technical problems. Okay. I think uh, we can go on to our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Mr. Timur Idrisa. He's the representative from Tajikistan and uh, he's the senior advisor for um, environmental organization. So the floor is yours, please. Okay, I will share the presentation right now. Yeah, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So uh, COVID became kind of a pose for nature, I would say. Uh, and from the fish which returned to the canals of Venice, uh, to the people in the North India who for the first time in 30 years uh, can see the Himalayas because of the uh, cleaner air. So we have all this positive uh, news coming from across the globe. Uh, we also see a significant uh, reduction, as Rahat mentioned, in uh, vehicular and air traffic, as well as industrial activities across the globe, especially in January and April. So the air quality, and of course not only air quality, uh, improved in many locations across the globe. So COVID helped with this. Uh, and uh, as again, as Rahat mentioned, there are some projections that the global uh, carbon emission uh, could decline between 4 and 5% and 8% by the end of this year. Uh, and at the same time, we can see some attempts to use crisis to promote, for example, uh, disposable plastic, which became an, an issue, like a global issue or for example, dismantle uh, uh, existing environmental regulations. As again, Rahat mentioned, it's also happening uh, in Russia, for example. Uh, in terms of uh, global uh, climate change, I think no one should have an illusion that COVID somehow will help solve the climate change problem, uh, especially in the long run. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, the global uh, CO2 concentration reached highest level actually in April this year. It became 416 ppm. So this is the highest what we got in a known record history so far. And uh, despite some reduction of CO2 emission this year, uh, it, I think, I mean, in general at least, we see the consensus that it particularly 
will not affect the general situation because of the emissions accumulated so far already in the atmosphere. Uh, so to turn the tide, we need kind of an urgent and fundamental shifts and they are not really happening so far. When we actually see uh, that some government actually trying, are trying to save like airlines and oil companies uh, uh, using uh, people's money, like the budgets, yes, uh, the state money to do that. So I think like instead of going from one crisis to another, I think we must try to build more like stable, sustainable system. And of course we have to do it today. Uh, and I think to make preservation and the uh, restoration uh, of the environment, uh, it should be one of the central tasks of the economy recovery. And COVID-19 is not a solution of course, but I think it's kind of a, a good starting point to do that. So this is very shortly, <laughs> and I will be happy to answer the question. Oh, Mirza is back. Good to see you, Mirza. Yeah, sorry, everyone. I faced some technical difficulties. My computer froze all of a sudden. So sorry about that, um, Mr. Timur. I couldn't introduce you properly. So um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just quickly introduce uh, Dr. Farhad. Uh, so Dr. Farhad, I mean, Janov's uh, paper is on COVID-19 to reveal hidden environmental and energy risks in Central Asia. Uh, Dr. Farkad is a co-founder and expert on energy security at the Central Asian Institute for Strategic Studies based in Kazakhstan. And he's also an assistant professor at the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Zaid University, UAE. Prior to this, he worked as a professor researcher at Narcos University and a senior research fellow at the Eurasian Research Institute. So over to you, Dr. Zarkad. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mirza. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I will just jump into the presentation, okay? <laughs> well, actually, uh, I have been trying to avoid the discussion of COVID-19 impact on environment and energy because actually you need some time to pass. You need to gather data, you need to gather information and then conduct a proper analysis, right? So that you can draw the conclusions and show the cause and effect linkage between the two. Yet, we cannot ignore the topic. The topic is important. And even today, we can draw actually some correlations between the COVID-19 and environment and the climate change all over the world. But in my presentation, I will be focusing on Central Asian region. Okay, so uh, in my presentation, I actually want to focus on COVID-19, on how the COVID-19 shapes and reshapes the economic policies and social behavior in Central Asian countries, which in turn affect uh, the environment and the climate change in the region. In this regard, I would want to focus on four important points. Those are going to be my arguments. Before going into the discussion of each of them, I just want to make this general statement. And this is actually to follow up on what Timur was saying uh, before me. Oh, well, Actually, the history shows that all the previous crisis situations, right, which actually created the window of opportunity for the countries to make this transition to sustainable, clean energy and sustainable, basically, environment and economies have failed. Almost all those crises for a short time has shown the reduction of CO2 emissions, but a couple years after, it actually resulted in, again, the jump of uh, greenhouse emissions all over the world. And a very classic example that most of the experts today are highlighting is the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, when, as a result of which, the CO2 emissions dropped by 1.4% in 2009, and then jumped all over to 6% in 2010. Right, so uh, we can see the windows of opportunity, but again, it's up to the decision makers and the people whether they want to draw some conclusions and change their behavior, change their policies so that we can 
have a long-term and sustainable goals achieved. Having said that, I would also want to emphasize that in Central Asia, there is a trade-off between economic gains, energy security, and the environment. It would be naive to believe that the governments would immediately give up uh, you know, the drivers of their economies, which is in three of the Central Asian countries are the fossil fuels, right? And at the same time, it would be naive to believe that the people in winter, uh, just because of environmental concerns, will probably stop using coal to heat their houses, right? Or for cooking. Um, yet, with proper agenda and clearly highlighted problems linking COVID-19 to economic policies and the environment can actually help somehow understand the importance of the environmental issues for sustainable economy and basically sustainable development. And this is the purpose of my presentation. So, as I said, I want to focus on four important points. Number one, the COVID-19 crisis threatens local efforts to meet the climate commitments that the countries have made. And a very good example would be Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, having signed the Paris Agreement, basically committed to the reduction of 25% of CO2 emissions by uh, 2030, right? Uh, further on, Kazakhstani government has adopted the Green Economy Initiative, which actually set even more ambitious goals to reduce CO2 emissions by 40% by 2050. Right? So these are very good initiatives. However, the COVID-19 has significantly affected the country's ability to make money. Basically, the COVID-19, which in turn resulted in drop of prices for oil, um, export of, uh, exports of oil and gas from the country, which are actually the main revenues for the budget, may not actually allow the country to make this transition and successfully reach the goals. To reach those goals, the country has to invest 2% of its GDP. So this is an open question whether the country can actually proceed. So COVID-19 is affecting the economic situation, which in turn affects its ability to uh, reach the climate commitments the country has made so far. Renewable energy sources, the clean energy. So but that's not the energy of the future anymore. That's the energy of the present. We have to make this transition if we want to have sustainable growth and sustainable development. Everyone agrees on that. Yet, unfortunately, in the Central Asian context, renewable energy sources are still very expensive. The only country which has successfully introduced renewable energy sources into its energy balance is Kazakhstan, right? And the, the recipe for success, basically, the secret was the fact that the government provided support. So basically a special institution was created which is purchasing electricity produced from renewable energy objects, right? Facilities. By five to six times higher prices than actually the coal fire thermal power plants are supplying the economy and the people. Very expensive. Can other countries follow? Uh, probably not. And according to different studies, the transition to renewable energy sources and the green economy may actually require the investment of up to $90 billion in between 2015 and 2045 in Kazakhstan. So the COVID-19, which is affecting the economic development and the revenues for the government, is causing a major uh, risk and the threat for the government to make this transition to the renewable energy sources. Uzbekistan is also a very good example of this, where the country may end up having, um, you know, financial di difficulties to introduce renewable energy sources. Number three, disaster risk management. I was part of this very interesting project conducted by Interna uh, well, International Organization for Migration, where we study transboundary water object in, in Central Asian countries. And actually we came to the conclusion that the country is absolutely incapable of making proactive measures when it comes to tackling the disaster risk management. 
right? So basically all the policies, they are reactive. When the crisis happens, uh, when the dam breaks down, then the government comes and helps, right? When the flood happens, when the, and, and the flooding is one of the major issues as well as the forest fires and, uh, and the landslides, the government uses reactive measures. However, proactive measures in the longer term can save both money and the lives of the people. Unfortunately, um, that's not happening. And, the, uh, and basically the spread of COVID-19 has challenged the country's reaction mechanism and revealed the limitations of overly centralized decision-making process in almost all Central Asian countries. The point is that Central Asian governments, they take too much responsibility and the people, they heavily rely on the government to come and save them. Financially, uh, in terms of uh, physical health, yet the transition- One more minute left, Dr. Farquhar. And, and, and solving the problem of uh, environment, environmental unsustainability requires the attempts and basically the efforts made by every single uh, you know, uh, actor concerned, the government, private sectors, citizens, households. Last but not least, COVID-19 has actually changed the behavior of the people. Uh, I should say in Central, oh, in the world, maybe we were lucky that the COVID-19 actually hit the region hard sometime early, in early spring. Imagine if the COVID-19 happened in winter, where almost all the people, they would have been forced to stay at home. And in Central Asian countries, most of them, they reside in rural areas, right? And they use coal, the consumption of coal in rural areas in almost all Central Asian countries, except for Turkmenistan, has increased. And imagine how this COVID-19 forcing people to stay home and then consume even more coal would have impacted environment and their health. This is the fourth, last, but not least, one of the major issues which I wanted to highlight in my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farkot. It was a very uh, interesting and insightful presentation. Um, so uh, we've had four brilliant papers being presented today, and it has generated a bit of interest among our audience. So um, in regards to the question and answers, I, would, I, I prefer to read them out in the order of the presentations. So firstly, we have a question from um, uh, uh, Jenny to Dr. Rahat. Um, so the question is, do you have a sense of how governments in Central Asia are likely to approach this? And by this, I think um, the, the guest is trying to um, imply green recovery. So do you have a sense of how governments in Central Asia are likely to approach green recovery? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I think I have uh, kind of two parts and two answers to this one. Um, will it impact the long-term plans, national plans of Central Asia related to climate change? It's very unlikely, most likely no. And I think Far Farhot also told about the main reasons. Uh, it's a long-term plans and uh, Central Asian countries in terms of uh, contribution to the, as a share of uh, CO2 emissions globally, it's a really tiny, tiny impact. So, and uh, Apart from uh, Kazakhstan, none of the Central Asian countries do not have uh, ambitious green economy or you know climate change plans. Now, for instance, in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are working on the uh, national contributions NDCs for uh, UNFCC, and uh, the uh, the plans and agendas are, are modest to say the least. Uh, but the second uh, part of uh, the second local impact on the green economy in general and what will be the impact of COVID and we talked about change in behavior. It's very interesting because, uh, for instance, in Bishkek, we have seen that the huge reduction in air pollution at the same time, most of the sectors, 70%, uh, uh, well, by different estimates, let's say 30% of people uh, who previously traveled to work, they stayed at home and still uh, they were functioning, working fully, they were fully employed. 
And at the same time, the university schools uh, were also, and some even kindergartens were doing online uh, uh, kindergartening, if I can say this. So this actually revealed a huge potential of emission reductions locally. So, uh, and this has uh, gave an impulse to reduction of emission, at least in transport, in these sectors, in education, definitely, in um, uh, online work or remote work has actually is gaining a momentum. So this will be, uh, I think, the lessons for the government. So indeed, the uh, huge uh, traffic jams and air pollution in large uh, Central Asian cities can be at least decreased by third uh, without, uh, without actually implementing some uh, new technologies, investing, uh, you know, something new. It's uh, using the available technology. I think this is the main lesson. Thank you very much for that, Rahat. Um, now we can move on to a question for Dr. Steinberg from Jenny again. Uh, so the question is, could you please expand on what you see as Kyrgyzstan's alternative to Chinese investment? Uh, well, I, my, my first point would be that uh, how much benefit does Kyrgyzstan actually get from Chinese investment? How many jobs are created? How much tax revenue comes to the state? Uh, and is it uh, instead something that benefits an elite class within the country? So I think uh, better, better uh, enforcement and implementation of the rules and laws you have would make Kyrgyzstan uh, appealing to more than just a, a, a Chinese investor. You have Kumtor that what I'm, what I'm told is eventually that will become owned by Chinese as well. So then really the, uh, economy is being being mortgaged to China, which then takes it out of the out of Kyrgyz control. So I, I really would say, uh, like with the uh, Atabashi uh, foreign trade logistics center outside Nara, and that was canceled in February, it's, it's good to reevaluate what's the actual local benefit of these investments. And if there isn't uh, adequate benefit, then then I, why continue with the with the investment? So, I think uh, making Kyrgyzstan a little bit more open to uh, other countries as well, besides just going right to China, would would be uh, prudent. And in our own research, there's actually a, a, a Kazakh mine in Chatgal that's well respected by the local community. So it can happen in your country. Um, I think it takes more enforcement by the government, and that'll take uh, interaction and be driven by the, the population. So it's something that the community at all levels, including here at uh, our level, need, need, to, uh, need to push for. So we have um, a general question for all our paper presenters uh, from Munima A. So the question is related to coronavirus waste. So I think by that she, is, she means the medical waste from uh, addressing the coronavirus crisis. So her question is, uh, has this become a new form of pollution, especially in terms of flooding the ocean? And uh, what are your thoughts on this? I'd say maybe the focus, yes, that, that all is an issue. Uh, here at Oxford, the, they're working on a vaccine. So that part of it, if we ever want to get back to a more normal life that we had before, it, it looks like we'll need a vaccine or, or some form of, of, of treatment. And that, that in itself, I'm not aware that that will have that much uh, negative impact on the environment. Anybody else want to share their thoughts or so, general uh, comments on the, on the presentation, your yeah. questions? Yes, Dr. I think it, well, I think it has nothing to do with COVID-19, right, with coronavirus. It's just, you know, uh, you export a new means of, I don't know, providing medical services. And of course, you have some waste. Actually, this is an indicator of, uh, again, inefficient uh, economic, social, you know, um, policies in the country. So it doesn't really matter whether it's coronavirus or other types of virus or other types of crisis. Uh, our behavior is actually polluting the ocean, polluting the air, mm -hmm. right? So um, uh, that, 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 that's a very good example. And uh, we have to keep in mind all those small examples when we add them up, then we will probably be able to see a huge problem, right? like that the, the mm. humanity is facing. Yeah, so, so that's mm. it. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, it's yeah, the, the issue we're trying to address is much broader than uh, COVID-19, mm -hmm. essentially. Exactly. So um, yeah, that's a good point, Dr. Farkhart. If 
any of you have any concluding remarks or comments, concerns regarding today's events, please, uh, you can address them now. Um, other yeah. than that, I think we can... I'll say something. Oh, yes, yes. So, please. As an outsider, uh, I, I come to Kyrgyzstan two or three times a year. It's great to, if you can keep this group together in some way, or maybe occasionally have a, a newsletter or a meeting. Uh, like Timur, I've been, I was in Tajikistan. I would have been happy to meet you last fall. I had no idea that what you were doing or anything. So it's great to have new linkages to uh, tie these people together. Same with Farhad and UAE. Um, so maybe part of the role of, of your, your, your group would be to, to connect people and, and keep this interest going into the future. Glad to receive one more question for our experts. Um, what advantages can nuclear energy bring Central Asia? Are there any alternatives to nuclear power plants? Yeah, I try to answer. So I think there are no any advantages of using nuclear power in Central Asia. And we have thousands of different papers across the globe about nuclear energy and why it's dirty and why it's not helping with the climate change and why it's not safe. Uh, in Central Asia, we can see that it's uh, mostly dried by uh, Russia and Rosatom, which is the main government body uh, in Russia for nuclear energy. But at the same time, we just recently had uh, a report that uh, indicates and shown the all other international contracts of Rosatom and how they failed because of the government uh, canceled the, the contract because of the price goes too high and so on and so on and so on. So I think uh, the alternatives should be, of course, renewable energy and energy efficiency. So this is the, the, the way forward. We don't need nuclear energy uh, in Central Asia at all. So we, we can live and <laughs> we can develop without nuclear energy. Thanks. Parhot wants to yep. please. If, if, if I may, uh, th thank you very much. That's an excellent question. Uh, well, I think we should distinguish nuclear energy from Ross Atom in here, right? So we definitely probably based on those reports don't need Ross Atom to build nuclear power plants. But uh, from the top of my head, the only advantage that I can think of is that nuclear energy can bring a diversification to our energy sectors, right? So uh, in Kazakhstan, 80% of electricity is produced in coal fired thermal power plants, right? So they need to diversify. Renewable energy sources, that's one way to go, right? But, but again, there would be lots of challenges along the way. In Uzbekistan, almost the entire sector, 86% of electricity is produced in gas and coal-fired thermal power plants, right? So we are still heavily uh, dependent on fossil fuels. Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, they are exceptions, of course, uh, right? With their huge massive hydropower potential, but all the dams are built during the Soviet time. Right, so uh, one thing that the scholars all around the world agree is that the energy sectors of the countries to be sustainable, to be stable, they have to be diversified, right? And in this sense, I don't think we should, you know, uh, kind of immediately ignore all the possibilities. I think we should study them. We should uh, carefully, uh, you know, research them and, and, and then make uh, basically conclusions for ourselves each country, to what extent they need to diversify their energy sectors and which way to go. And uh, that's probably the question is now when Nargiza said Central Asia, she probably had in mind Uzbekistan, right? Uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in Uzbekistan, I am from Uzbekistan originally, right? And the country has been to some extent, uh, you know, um, in an energy crisis situation, right? The economy is developing, the economy is booming, uh, population is increasing, uh, the share of the population, you know, in the overall electricity consumption is really going up. So basically in the future, not being able to meet our energy demand will have a direct impact on the people. In the 1990s, in Central Asian countries, only 15 to 20% of electricity was consumed by households. Now it's 60%. 
So uh, from, th from this perspective, nuclear energy might be kind of, you know, uh, a danger. Uh, by, by, by the way, um, uh, there are only two major known catastrophes, right, when it comes to uh, nuclear power plants. One is Chernobyl uh, out there, so I was close by, and the second one is uh, in Japan in 2011, and I was in Japan at that time, right? So actually, I know that it might be dangerous, I feel. That's right. Uh, but nonetheless, I think from the diversification point of view, we have to consider all the possibilities. And with the new technologies all around the world, there are lots of countries which are exploiting nuclear energy successfully. And nuclear energy is, uh, you know, a, an important component of their energy security. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farkad. Indeed, I mean, one of the most defining factors of energy security is the issue of diversification. Um, and that, that issue has gained so much prominence after the oil crisis of the 1970s. Um, so uh, we actually have another question. Um, and this, once again, is directed towards everyone. Um, so um, this question is from Tolgo Nye. Um, and the question is, what would you suggest to the civil sector to do in coping with climate change issues overall and the COVID-19 impact? So what is the responsibility of the, the civil sector when it comes to climate change and the COVID-19 uh, crisis? I, I'd say one thing for the civil sector is to raise awareness of, of uh, climate issues. And when I go to Bishkek and speak to groups like yourself, there's much awareness. But once you go a few kilometers away, nobody pays any attention to, to climate change. The message isn't getting there. So civil society could certainly expand it beyond capitals. And it's the same in other, other countries as well. So it's getting information to the individual so they can change behavior. Yeah, small comment uh, regarding the energy, which is also linked to this question as well. I, I agree with Farhot in terms of that uh, energy in Central Asia must be diversified. Uh, uh, this is true, but at the same time, uh, nuclear energy is not the only option to be uh, looked for because renewable energy for the last 20 years uh, made a huge jump in the improvement energy efficiency. But uh, these both questions, I think these are secondary. The primary question in Central Asia to address is energy intensity of our GDPs. So basically, how much do we consume energy <coughs> to produce one unit or one dollar of GDP? Central Asian countries have the, one of the highest GDP intensities in, uh, in uh, Europe and Central Asia, even in the world. So, mm -hmm. and if you look about on the energy intensity, water inten intensity, material consumption, we are really high in this. So our economies are wasteful. And this is uh, for some reason, uh, our policymakers do not want to address. They want to make a construct a new dams, new energy power stations. Of course, it brings a lot of new investment, lots of money, and they want to build something all the time. They talk about all the time. But at the same time, nobody wants to address and save the energy we already produce. It's very strange to me. Uh, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, for instance, in Tajikistan as well, there has been few attempts in Kazakhstan as well, but uh, the attempts uh, have been weak. And this is also relates to the second question about the awareness of climate change in Central Asian societies, what the civil society should do. So first of all, I think that, uh, again, we should, uh, civil society should look at the wastefulness of our Central Asian economies. And if you look at the micro level, uh, look uh, what we do with, in Central Asia with our celebration economy, right? So-called toy economy, celebration economy. So we, in uh, especially uh, Troy probably knows, and for foreigners, when they come in the fall or autumn season, it's like huge weddings, you know, lots of uh, people throwing away food, you know, just uh, driving huge uh, pickups and drives and Jeeps just, just to show that how much money we have and how much actually, money we can waste. I mean, this is, uh, and, and this is actually consumption. That's why also, as Farhot said, that uh, energy consumption has shifted from the uh, industry to consumers. So we are trying to consume 
uh, as the Westerners to have iPhones, laptops, and mobile phones. At the same time, it's also coincided with our uh, uh, traditions to show off. Yeah. So in economics, we have called uh, uh, economic terms by uh, uh, by American economists. They're called conspicuous consumption. So we consume something to show. Uh, so we have uh, our desire to consume as uh, as Western civilization, and we have our Oriental uh, uh, tradition to show off what we have. And when we have both of them, <laughs> we have wasteful economies. So I think this is uh, what it's a good topic for civil society to look at. Thank you. In my presentation, I mentioned that the transition to uh, sustainable economies, right, clean environment requires active participation of all stakeholders. That would be the state, private sector, and citizens, right? And in this regard, I think civil society organizations role is crucial because they can create the bridge and they can show the governments, the state, that they cannot make a successful transition without actively engaging the people. Do not really uh, kind of, you know, uh, exclude people from this transition. Don't try to uh, take all the financial burden on yourselves, run all the programs, engage local people, engage civil society organizations actively in all your initiatives. And that would be the key to the success in the upcoming future transition. Thank you very much, Dr. Farkad. Um, if I may ask a question of, um, the, to the speakers or, uh, gathered here today, um, I'm a political scientist, so I'm interested in the political impacts, the geopolitical impacts of COVID-19 crisis. Um, so, um, Within Central Asia, has, what has the impact of COVID-19 been on the relations between the countries and the relations between the countries and China? For example, um, in Australia, where I'm from, the relationship between Australia and China has deteriorated to uh, such an extent that um, China has um, undertaken retaliatory measures when it comes to trade um, of beef and coal with, with Australia. Um, so has there been any political repercussions between the countries of Central Asia and also between the countries of Central Asia and China due to the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, I, I can give you a quick Mongolia example. Uh, <laughs> Mongolia closed its border with China in, in February, in late February. So it's one of the first countries in the world to do that. And uh, actually it's proven very uh, popular um, for the, the government and the people. Uh, we had a Mongolian here working on our project, and she was stuck until last Friday. And in Mongolia, when you go home, you have three weeks quarantine in a government institution, and then two weeks more at home. They have, I think, 59 cases and zero deaths. So they've mm -hmm. been very good. So in Mongolia, there's great popular support. China, uh, they, they just say we can't take any Chinese because we have no adequate facilities to, to deal with COVID. So there's been no international problem with China, uh, but it's been very interesting domestically because today there's a, an election for parliament and the, the ruling party is expected to win this because of how it's perceived the very tough handling of COVID shows them to be a strong responsive government following what the people want, which is this sense of protection. So they're happy to be isolated because actually it reduces their international issues, problems, debts, all, all this. So it's quite an interesting dynamic there. It's worked very well for the government. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg. Uh, Dr. Farkov? Yeah, uh, just a couple of words. I think the COVID-19 in terms of politics and geopolitics is a very difficult test for Central Asian governments, right? Mm -hmm. Because, well, um, of course, we shouldn't blame the people when they face financial uh, challenges, when they lose their jobs, right? When they, for some reason, become sick and have to go to the hospitals and the hospitals cannot accommodate everyone, right? So they, um, well, eventually start blaming someone and uh, mm -hmm. the obvious choice becomes the state, the government. Why haven't they prepared us, the economy, for this kind of crisis situations? why our healthcare system is not properly functioning, why are we losing jobs. When you open, uh, you know, basically uh, inside country movements, new cases of coronavirus, you know, um, come along and then, then the people again blame government for opening 
up everything too soon. So basically the point is that the governments, this is a very difficult test for the governments, right? And depending on how they pass this test, uh, the, uh, how quick the recovery is going to be, will probably uh, indicate to what extent existing systems uh, will continue functioning, right? Um, uh, and uh, uh, so basically, and political and social stability in those countries will remain. When it comes to China, again, um, uh, right, some sort of uh, kind of without any major proofs, but you still hear uh, here and there people saying that it's all because of Chinese, you know, uh, uh, wrong to some extent decisions made that we all ended up being in this very difficult situation. And again, people are being desperate, so they are trying to find someone to blame, right? And uh, right now it's very important uh, to uh, make the entire process as transparent as possible, right? Engaging all stakeholders so that the people would feel engaged. They take responsibility for what is happening right states takes the responsibility for what is happening and perhaps as one of the windows of opportunity for accountability and transparency this COVID-19 could be a very good means to uh, to move along thanks thank you so much Dr. Farkad um, it's very interesting to hear your perception about um, Central Asia and, and certainly I think you're right it, this definitely is um, is a huge test for governments all over the world. I mean, you see some, how some of the developed countries around the world have struggled to contain this virus. Um, now we have another question, um, and this is once again directed to, uh, uh, to the, all the paper presenters. Um, so this question is from Syed Nasserullah Musami, uh, and the question is, um, how do developing countries shift to green energy? Um, and as green energy is infra in an infrastructural project, which needs which needs sustainable financing, um, how how can uh, this sustainable uh, financing be be done for um, for a green energy project? I, I I think that for especially for the developing countries, it's important to create the conditions when either the private sector or the investors, uh, either government or private investors would come and invest money in green energy. It's not like the government itself have to spend millions of dollars from the budget. So it's for, for them, it, it's, it's, it's to create the conditions, favorable conditions. So the people with money could come, build and sell this energy to the people or to the industries or whatever. So, and this is, I think this is one of the important issues is to, to create favorable conditions for the green energy. It's not to spend your own money, but to do everything other people, other government, other private sector came and build it for you. So just give them preferences to do that. I think this is one of the way to go with it in the uh, developing countries, especially. Thank you very much, Mr. Timur. Um, anybody else want to add any thoughts to that? Well, I won't, but I don't want to take up too much space. No, no, please, please, yes. please do go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, sorry. So uh, when it comes to the transition to green economies, uh, each country in Central Asia, and I'm saying that because I have recently, you know, um, submitted my paper on renewable energy sources to Kabar Asia policy paper, which will soon be published, I hope. Right. So, um, and and the conclusion that I draw from, you know, the analysis in uh, in the paper is that each Central Asian country, uh, at the current stage, differs when it comes to making this transition to sustainable economies and the green economy. In Kazakhstan, as I said previously, the main and the most important issue is to engage all the stakeholders. In Uzbekistan, the most important policy priority is to establish trustworthy relationships uh, with foreign investors. The country cannot make the transition as Timur said, right? The country cannot pay for everything. The state cannot pay for everything. They need foreign investment. And if the government can show that this foreign investment, uh, you know, um, is protected, right? Investors are protected. Then uh, there is a hope 
for you know a larger scale renewable energy facilities you know of projects implementation in the country and also small is big quite often in central asian countries authorities they ignore the small scale projects but uh, instead of building one large power plant how about building 1000 small uh, you know uh, renewable energy objects rooftop uh, solar panels you know uh, mini or a small hydropower plants all around the country small is big it will have huge effect on improving households people's energy security and sustainability right from uh, these are different ways that the countries can actually uh, go to and and, and uh, again along with other policies being implemented at this moment that could be a guarantee for successful transition thank you Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Farkhout. Um, if I may ask a follow-up question on um, what the two present, uh, people presenters just discussed. Um, in many developing countries, there are political and corporate interests that support um, non-renewable energy. So you have, for instance, um, the coal mafia in India. In countries like Australia, the large mining corporations uh, make huge political donations and um, these interests essentially um, will not support the move from non-renewable to renewable energy. So how do you actually counter um, these very powerful entities that support non-renewable energy? That's an excellent question, <laughs> right? And of course, uh, you know, um, um, behind the scene, this is all happening, I guess, in almost all countries, including Central Asian countries. Um, I think making the entire process transparent, that would be one way to go, right? Uh, so if you uh, review information and data and statistics on the price formation, uh, how much renewables are being introduced, who is purchasing, at what price, then people will see, everyone will see, and then there would be, uh, you know, little room for making these maneuvers, right? Um, but on the other hand, we also uh, should not underestimate the importance of other actors or uh, like, um, let me give you a, a clear example, like in Kazakhstan, for instance, renewable energy sector is being developed. They actually met the 3% goal by 2000, uh, the 2020, right, that they set earlier uh, this decade. So they are uh, on the right track. However, in, uh, in, in, in Kazakhstan, the only reason why renewables are actually being developed is because the government uh, instructed uh, power purchasing companies to purchase electricity from basically independent private renewable energy facilities for five to six times higher the price that they can purchase from coal-fired thermal power plants. Uh, the price which is then being distributed among the population so basically that's the government support but the people are paying for it um, that's okay when the share of renewables is less than three percent it will go unnoticed but imagine if the transition happens and the share of renewables increases exponentially and and and, and then this financial burden lying on the shoulders of the consumers or power purchasing entities of course um, will become a major problem, not only for them, but also for the, for, uh, for the government implementing those policies. So having said that, uh, these uh, shadow economy mechanisms and the tools in the energy sector, they exist to some extent, they are drawing back or pushing back all those initiatives. Uh, yet, if the process is made at least to some extent more transparent, then it will probably exclude itself. So that's the thing I can think of. Thank you. If, if I could give another example, in the, in the UK, it's driven by, uh, by general uh, population demand. So we've had many weeks where no, no fossil fuels are used to generate any, any energy in the UK. So this is just, just a, a place where the government and the people actually can agree. And the UK government sees the UK can be a leader in production of wind power, et cetera. And, um, the society demands it, we want it, and they think their vote's in it. So it's, it's happened 
but also the UK uses uh, less energy per person uh, than the US, for example, or other developed economies. So part of it is the mental uh, mindset of the population. But the population can drive this. It's like we were speaking earlier about awareness of climate change and these impacts. But it, someone has to give the information and show and help convince people that this is a worthy goal and that in the long run, it'll, it'll not just save energy and pollution and CO2, but that it, it, it saves money. The situation about the Kyrgyzstan transferring to green energy and the, the coal uh, miners uh, lobbying, I think in the case of Kyrgyzstan, we have good chances, I think, switching to clean energy because uh, coal is mainly used for heating in residential areas. Uh, it's, not, it's not the main source of uh, electricity at this moment, at least. Uh, despite the, you know, the investment from Chinese uh, companies, which I actually built couple, one or two actually uh, coal-based uh, uh, energy stations, but uh, it's mainly residential. And from residents' perspective of you, we did a survey last year. Actually, the reason why people in the rural areas, especially, use coal as a main source of heating, because of the low voltage and unreliable electricity. Um, so uh, if uh, once, let's say, electricity supply, the quality has been improved or renewable energy has been fed into the system or the old uh, uh, houses uh, have been energy efficiently retrofitted, for instance, right? This is actually a question of time, I think, because coal, uh, according to our data, it shows that it's labor intensive, it's uh, polluting, and it takes a lot of time as well for it. Even, even when we compare the uh, incomes uh, and uh, in terms of the expenses, electricity and the uh, coal, uh, in most of the cases, uh, the uh, people prefer to use electricity, but they, at the same time, uh, the only impediment, a barrier at the moment, uh, at least for the majority, it's because they're unreliable and low voltage of the electricity. I guess uh, one of the issues with hydroelectricity is also the seasonality of it. Um, sorry, not hydroelectricity, with, with solar panels and with um, wind turbines. It's the, it's the seasonality of it that affects the, the supply as well. Um, at least that's one of the issues that we have currently. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to uh, ask you whether um, the cost of renewables is also a factor that impedes um you know it's it's proliferation um we know that the cost of storage and solar panels is rapidly decreasing um but uh some supporters of non-renewable energy or those who have vested interest in coal and oil um point towards the fact that it that you know um changing to a, a new form of uh, energy is is very expensive because the whole infrastructure around energy needs to be changed. Um, so for example, it's not so much just the cost of panels that needs to be taken into account, or just the co cost of wind turbines, but also how um, you know, we start using electric cars, for example, um, and uh, various infrastructure that needs to be developed uh, downstream. So how do you see the costs of transitioning from, to renewables um, affecting you know, um, the, the realization of the green economy? And again, from my recent study, the cost is the major factor for why renewables are not being developed in Central Asian region. It's still too expensive for uh, the economies, for the state budget, basically to handle, right? Uh, on the other hand, we shouldn't really, uh, well, uh, we should look at the picture in a very complex way, right? Um, in Central Asian countries, over 60% of all power production facilities, they have outrun their life cycle. They were built during the Soviet time. They're highly inefficient. Modernization, investment in modernizing those facilities is helping to some extent, but for how long? Right? So now the question is, we have to build new power production facilities to meet uh, growing demand. And again, along with other initiatives of energy efficiency and you know, um, making our economies less energy intensive, but still we have to build new energy uh, electricity production facilities. And the question here, which one we should choose? Those based on uh, fossil fuels or renewable energy sources? 
Renewable energy sources are now expensive because all those investors, they are trying to recover the cost of their investment, right? But the cost of their investment can be recovered in 15 to 20 years, uh, considering this, you know, like a favorable tariff set for that. After this 20 years, for the next 30, 40 years, those facilities would probably produce electricity almost zero of cost, right? So if the question now, um, before the, before the government and private energy companies, whether to build energy producing facilities, power production facilities, uh, running on fossil fuels or renewable energy sources, the answer should be obvious, right? In the longer term perspective, uh, renewables will pay off. Unfortunately, Central Asian states, they don't have money right here and right now, right? And that's becoming a major challenge. And that's where the private sector as well as foreign investors, they can step in, right? And, uh, and basically be the drivers of this change. Um, we have another question from Mr. Syed Nasrallah Musawmi. Um, so his question is, would it be advan an advantage for countries with oil and gas reservoirs like Russia to shift into green energy? Um, since these reservoirs are um, one of the main parts of the government revenue. So countries that have huge reserves of oil and gas, would it be advantages, advantages for them to shift to green economy? Yep, Mr. Mr. Yeah, Kim. If short, uh, yes, of course, because if they want to be the leaders and to be competitive, yes, they have to shift to green energy. If they don't want to be there, <laughs> They could stay uh, with the coal and oil and gas. Yeah. I guess um, the Russia actually could follow the example of Norway. Uh, actually, Norway, as you know, it's one of the largest exporters of oil in the world, but at the same time, one of the greenest uh, economies in the world, yeah, with a, a large uh, renewable energy production, at the same time, the largest fleet of uh, electric cars per capita as well. So. Obviously, this is an example how the oil funds are, have been used widely, at least in the, uh, green energy. Uh, it is possible, but, uh, but so far, according to my knowledge, at least, that Russian oil, uh, oil companies, at least, they do not have uh, uh, green component in uh, as, as many oil private companies have the, trying to shift to green economy. Russian oil companies uh, have not announced it yet. So I think this is, but of course it's part of the national budget, it's important. And also, I, by the way, to follow up on the example of Norway, uh, I have my colleagues in Norway and they were saying that Norway is shifting to renewable energy sources and consuming clean energy sources, but still making a lot of money by exporting oil and gas to other countries, right? And again, uh, the, if you draw the parallels, uh, with Russia, Russia can also start the transition to renewable energy sources to make its own domestic market, domestic economy more sustainable and cleaner. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the Russia uh, should stop exporting oil and gas and make money from this. So actually developing oil and gas sector and transition to renewables in Russia should not necessarily be mutually exclusive, right? And the example of Norway could probably be a model to follow. Thanks. Uh, so, um, thank you very much for your detailed uh, comment, by the way. Um, so, I think we've had a fantastic session today. We've had four very good and informative papers being presented by um, uh, international academics, and um, which has generated um, a very interactive uh, discussion. Um, and so, I'd just like to thank the four paper presenters, uh, Mr. Timur, Dr. Farkhod, Dr. Steinberg and Dr. Rahat, thank you for dedicating your time and effort in um, sharing your knowledge about this very important and topical issue. I've certainly learned a lot and um, I'm sure our uh, participants have also learned um, from you. And um, I would also like to thank the participants for their interests um, and for joining us today. And um, lastly, I would like to thank the Institute for War, Peace, uh, War and Peace Reporting in Central Asia for collaborating with the OSC Academy uh, in hosting this uh, international discussion. 
Um, and thanks also goes to um, uh, Ms. Jamilia Aitakunova um, for all her hard work in uh, making this session happen. Um, so I will just ha uh, hand it over to Jamilia. She may have some last comments on um, uh, administration issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, dear all, dear speakers, dear Mirza, I would like to express um, our gratitude from the Institute for War and Peace Reporting for uh, making it to our event and presenting and also discussing um, all of the urgent issues uh, regarding climate and environment. Um, thank you very much and uh, looking forward to working with you in the future as well.